Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you everyone for coming today um, for this conversation. My name is Kristen Turner and I have been an educator for over 20 years. And in that time, I have always been a teacher who has experimented with technology. So from my first year of teaching, which was as a high school English teacher, through today, I embrace technology, I play with it in my classroom, and I think about how we can use technology to better connect with each other, to create and consume material. So because I've always been interested in technologies as a teacher, I became a researcher that looked at digital literacies and how we're using educational technologies in the classroom. This presentation today is not about tools of technology, but I'm going to challenge those of you who are online live and, and watching if you hear me mention a tool that can be used as a tool of technology in the classroom, kind of name it in the chat and if somebody can go find the link to it and put it in the chat, it will be there as a resource for you. So that's one step of us being a little bit interactive during this somewhat one-sided presentation right now. So we're going to talk about virtual teaching and learning in the COVID-19 shutdown. Oops. The greatest adventure is what lies ahead. Today and tomorrow are yet to be said. I grew up listening over and over to the soundtrack of The Hobbit. Uh, it was actually on um, a 33 record that my parents had and I would play it over and over and listen to the anthem or what I considered the anthem of that story, The Greatest Adventure. For those of you that might not know, Bilbo, the main character in The Hobbit, is a he's living a comfortable content life in bag end until gandalf the wizard comes in and convinces him to go on a great adventure and he does he goes off with gandalf and he um, comes across some dangerous things um, and encounters some danger such as trolls and goblins and even a dragon but he also finds tools and other others to help him on this adventure he finds a small sword and he meets elves who help him and ultimately he finds a gold ring and this gold ring becomes important later on it is a symbol of hope that can bring peace to all all of civilization, but the ring also holds some dark powers and depending on who is using and wielding the ring, it's e either this goodness or this evil. So as I said, I started out my career as an English teacher and the English teacher in me can't help but see an analogy between this great adventure that we have been thrust into and the adventure that Bilbo took. We were kind of moving along comfortably. Um, for those of us in higher ed, we were about halfway through the semester. For those in K to 12, they had almost made it through that really long hump between New Year's and springtime. And then all of a sudden, boom, we're pushed into a new adventure, uh, really without much warning. In most cases, we were given some tools. So, you know, we've heard things like Zoom or Google Classroom or Flipgrid or VoiceThread. So we have these tools um, that we can use on this adventure, but do we really know the power of those tools? Most of us right now, I feel like we feel like we're in suspended anim animation. And some cases we feel like we're free falling and we just don't know when we're gonna hit the bottom. But what I wanna challenge us to think about is that we're on a journey, we're on an adventure. And when we get our bearings and step back to reflect on this great adventure, we will be different. Just like Bilbo's different when he comes back to Bag End, he's not quite as content anymore. And I'm wondering how will we view our adventure in hindsight? Are we going to embrace digital learning or are we gonna reject it kind of the way it was thrown at us? I wanna start just by talking a little bit about distance education because that's what we are in the midst of. We are learning and teaching from a distance, but this isn't something that's new to this digital computing era. Actually, some scholars think that distance education began uh, back in the 18th century when correspondence between teachers and students who were apart from each other um, started happening. And then by the late 1800s, the University of Chicago actually um, was the first academic institution to formalize correspondence education. So this was the first phase of distance education and it happened by mail. 
And then as we moved into the 20th century with new technological advancements like audio and video broadcasting, we had a second phase of distance education um, using new tools of technology. But in both the correspondence and the broadcasting phases, education was really about transmission of knowledge. So a teacher would send their knowledge, what they knew, to a student, and then the student would consume that knowledge and in a lot of cases send back what they learned to the teacher who would evaluate it. With the rise of digital computing and new tools of the digital age, there are many more opportunities for interaction and not just transmission of knowledge. So students and teachers can interact with each other, students can interact with their peers, and students can interact with people outside of their class uh, community through using digital tools. So this really opens up a realm of possibilities. When we think about how we design classes in education, there are basically three forms. The first form would be face-to-face -face classes. And then we also have blended classes and online classes. Blended classes take components of face-to-face -face education and online education and combine them together. Right now, we can't do face-to-face -face instruction and we can't do blended instruction because that involves face-to-face. -face. So we are really looking at fully online learning. And when we talk about online learning, we're thinking about synchronous or asynchronous activities. So synchronous activities are when teachers and students or students and students are online together at the same time. So that is very much like we are doing in this Zoom presentation right now where we have some people who are watching this presentation live. They are interacting in the chat and we are doing this at the same time as synchronous. For those who are watching this presentation after the fact, because Stuart said it's going to be posted on the YouTube channel and it will be there for a while, um, you can't interact with the people who are here live, but you can see what was said. So that would be asynchronous learning. You're doing it on your own time. So we think about synchronous or asynchronous activities. We also wanna think about how our students are interacting in the online spaces. And there are three things that I think about as a teacher when I'm designing online learning experiences. First, how are students interacting with content? Second, how are they interacting with peers? And then third, how are they interacting with the teacher? So all of this interaction involves me designing and planning what's going to happen in the online course even before the course or the class is launched. We call this front loading, front loading in online education, where we are creating content and designing our learning spaces before the students even come to us. This does happen in face-to-face -face education as well, but it's a little bit different in online learning because there is so much front loading that happens. Um, and what this might look like when I'm thinking about interactions is that a, I might select an article for a student to read and they read that article on their own. But then they also might be discussing that article via social annotation using a tool of technology with their peers. And then I might set up a Zoom video call for a small group who has read that article and discussed it together using social annotation for me as the teacher to interact with them, to give them feedback on their thinking and to push their learning further. So here's an example from real world practice that was, this is actually the marginal syllabus, which is a group of educators who read professional texts together and then talk about them using the tool hypothesis. Um, so hypothesis is an annotation tool and you can see the article is highlighted, but next to the article there are annotations and you can see that there are replies to those annotations. So there's a conversation happening about the article that's being read. You'll notice this is an asynchronous conversation because the dates of those annotations are not at the same time. So students are reading this article or learners are reading this article and responding to each other on their own time. The instructional decisions that I would need to make as a teacher who is using this kind of pedagogy in an online space are First of all, what is the content and then how will my students interact with it? So I would need to decide, are they going to read an article? Are they going to watch a video? Are they going to listen to a podcast? Or is there some other kind of content that I want them to engage with? 
but then how are they going to interact? Is it going to be a public interaction or a private interaction? And by that I mean, is it just the student and the material that would be private, or is the student sharing their interaction with someone other than themselves? So that would be public. So the example of social annotation where they are having a conversation with others would be public interaction. When we think about public interactions, we have to think about what is the scope of that public? Is it just the class that I am teaching? Is it maybe two classes or three classes? And that would be cross-class interaction. Or is it fully public out there on the internet, kind of like we are here with Zoom, where anyone can come and interact? And then finally, I need to think about how I'm going to give feedback to the students on their learning related to that content that I selected to share with them. So basically, this, there's a lot of work that goes into designing online learning experiences. Um, we need to create content. We need to establish norms of participation um, for interactions with peers and with teachers. And then we also need to plan for the technologies that we want to use for those interactions. And of course, we need to have backups for those technologies because so far we've been you know, pretty lucky that the, most of the technologies that teachers and learners need and want to use are working right now. But I have been in situations where I plan to use a particular tool and then it shuts down mid-semester. Um, so I have to think about why I'm using the tool and what might be my backup plan if something goes wrong with the technology. Basically, this is all to say that effective online learning instruction can't be designed overnight. Yet, that's kind of the situation. Um, doing all of that can be overwhelming and it can actually be scary if you're not familiar with online pedagogy or tools of technology. So right now we have teachers of all levels, um, K through graduate school, working in under, uncharted territory. We also have parents, particularly parents of K-8 to learners who need more support at home. Those parents are now managing students, they're acting as substitute teachers, and they're managing their own work from home situations that are all new to them. We have older learners like high school students and college students who are man managing multiple courses the expectations and requirements of multiple teachers, many of whom have never taught online before. Um, and so they are being learners perhaps in a new space while their teachers are also learning how and navigating this new space. So this has real implications for learning. But it's not all bad news because there actually is good news. There's research to show that this can all work. An international team of researchers looked at meta-analyses, which are basically studies that kind of look across all the other studies that have been done. And they also looked across literature reviews. Um, their goal was to provide an overview of the state of online research in higher ed. And their uh, conclusion from that overview is that there is strong evidence for the effectiveness of distance education, with several studies pointing to the comparable or better effectiveness of distance education to face-to-face -face education. So there is hope. Um, we also have people looking at K-12 online research, and there's a research collective called uh, International Association for K-12 Online Learning that is a leader in this field, and the link is right there um, if you'd like to check out their work. So the research is young in this field, but it is promising that we can do a good job and that distance education can be an antidote. However, I can't stress enough that right now what we're experiencing does not represent our best efforts at online education and we can't judge the potential of virtual learning based on what's happened these last couple of weeks and what's going to happen these next couple of weeks. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what we have seen is that we need to examine some of the holes that this situation is exposing for us. So as one, of, one school administrator said to me uh, about two weeks ago, 
This crisis is uncovering and amplifying so many problems that were there all along. And one of the biggest problems that has kind of reared its ugly head is the access to technology. So higher ed institutions and K-12 institutions, when um, the shutdowns occurred, basically were scrambling for technology. How do we put technology in our students' hands who don't have it at home? How do we give students who don't have Wi-Fi access access to the internet so that they can stay connected to us? How do we keep giving our students content to move forward if we don't have the tools of technology to interact with them? Um, so, you know, what, the big question is why is this, why are we scrambling for technology right now? It's 2020, we use technology on a daily basis. We can't do most jobs. Uh, in the world right now without having access to technology, but yet we have learners who don't have that access at home. And the answer is really, we as a society didn't invest in it. We haven't been investing it. So researchers in digital literacies and educational technology and teachers who have been using technologies for a long time have been advocating that schools move faster, that we catch up to society in how we are educating our students um, so that they are prepared to go out into the real world. But we've been moving too slowly and this situation is really amplifying a digital divide that has existed for a very long time. And it's also a digital divide that contributes to opportunity gaps which do affect learning. So the question is really, will this moment spur change? Um, we have seen some change happening. Uh, which is good news. <clears throat> but it's not just about the structural changes that need to happen. We also have to rethink uh, how teaching and learning happens. And this moment is, is bringing, again, it's bringing to light some of these issues that were always there and always underlying education. So today's learners need some um, skills that will help them to succeed at, in the real world, both of school and these are skills that are actually identified by employers of what they value in employees. So today's learners need to practice self-regulation, meaning they need to set goals and manage distractions and reflect on their progress. And then they need to persist through challenges. They need to persist through failures, which are inevitable in life, especially when you're working with technologies. And sometimes they even need to just persist to reading to the end of an article or the end of something they've been assigned to read by their teacher, their professor, or their employer. Skills of communication, flexibility, critical cons consumption and creation, and problem solving are, have all been identified by today's employers um, as imperative. And uh, finally, it's really important for learners to understand their role in the world and to be able to connect and collaborate with others. And that's really important for us in a global society as citizens. Unfortunately, traditional instruction that focuses on transmission of content, like I was talking about before, um, rather than on interactions between students and how students are interacting with each other and their teachers and others outside the classroom, that traditional instruction doesn't do a great job of developing these skills. So we have to rethink teaching and learning as well. Research on connected learning uh, shows that there's promise when student interaction and interest are at the core of what we do in our classrooms. So this is a model of connected learning that um, articulates that we design learning opportunities that start with student interests and then from there, students identify relationships through communities or peers and mentors that can help them develop their knowledge and skills related to their interests. And then they turn from consuming and creating related to their interests to think about opportunities for um, their careers, for future academics, or um, you know, other powerful outcomes like engagement in politics or society or economics. Um, to help them. <clears throat> so what this might look like in practice, um, this is an example from a middle school student who was assigned a Genius Hour project. And Genius Hour evolves from the Google 20% time where Google employees were allotted 20% of their time to kind of follow projects that they weren't assigned to work on, but that they were interested in um, and see what happened with those projects. So this young lady was assigned a Genius Hour project and she started with her interest in using
using technology for creation and connection. Um, through that, she started to reach out to teachers and online mentors and some peers to learn particularly how to edit videos and how to use GarageBand to edit audio and how to work um, these things together. I think that originally she was really curious about how YouTubers um, created their videos and so she wanted to know more about that. And then related to her Genius Hour project, she started making a website, but she didn't know how to do that. So she reached out to another teacher, not the teacher that assigned her a genius hour, but another teacher that she knew was really good at making websites. And she talked with that teacher and has now designed a website. And you'll see, my name is Megan, and this is my genius hour project. I wanted to teach people how to edit videos so they can become a YouTube star. So that's the project that she's doing for her genius hour. But then she, another teacher found out that she was really good with technology and she was learning all about it. So that teacher asked her to create the Megan Institute of Technology, which was basically answering questions that her peers and other teachers kept asking this teacher and he couldn't answer. So Megan was creating videos and screencasts that would answer those questions. Um, so this is where she starts to think about how this learning that she's doing and these connections that she, are, she is making can open up opportunities for her. She's begun to articulate that these are skills that will help me when I get a job someday. But even more importantly, during this COVID-19 shutdown, Megan has become tech support for other people who want to learn. So she has become a tech support person for her dance teacher who is learning to take dance classes online. Um, she has become a tech support person for her grandparents who are asking, how do I use things like Zoom? And she is really opening up to this idea of uh, this is something that I am good at and that can take me further in life. So that's the heart of connected learning where interests and the relationships and the opportunities are coming together. And it's really powerful learning that can happen with and through the use of technology. If we're going to look at opportunities like connected learning, then we need to shift our teaching away from transmission models of just delivering content to really looking at student-centered learning. So in student-centered learning, inquiry and collaboration and reflection are the center of the classroom, which means that the teacher is not. The teacher is a lead learner in the classroom, but not the only expert because there can be expertise among the students in the classroom, but then there's also expertise beyond the classroom. So we can bring other experts into what we're doing here and learn beyond the walls of what we have. Technology opens up the possibilities. And when you're talking about virtual learning, there are just so many possibilities of finding expertise and um, mentors beyond just the professor or just the teacher who is leading that class. If we're going to move in this direction, there are two major misconceptions that we need to consider, though. The first is that we are working with students who are digital natives. Um, and the second is that we are delivering remote instruction right now. So I hear this phrase all the time right now that it, we are delivering remote instruction. Um, and to deliver is again going back to that transmission model. And even though we have students with us who have been born into a world of technology and by the time they are one year, 18 months old, are mimicking their parents' use of technology, that doesn't mean that they've actually learned how to learn with and through technology. So they might be very good at social connections and using their mobile phones, but does that mean they know how to be learners with them? So let's talk for a second about our students who are inundated right now with information as they are on screens trying to manage learning, trying to manage expectations of, in many cases, multiple teachers at the same time. They have a lot of information coming at them. And then, of course, they have opportunities to move away from that information. There are lots of distractions out there, social media, emails, oh, I'll click on that link and go down the, the rabbit hole. Um, in addition to everything that they could just go out and do differently, they have notifications for most of the apps that are popping up while they are trying to work. So all of the technology that they have is a um, there's a possibility for being distracted and losing focus in their learning and now we've thrust them into this situation 
Um, that doesn't mean that they can't handle it. It just means that they have to practice self-regulated learning on a different level than what they might have had to do in face-to-face -face settings. So research shows that developing self-regulated learning strategies actually helps with the success of student learners regardless of the setting that they are in. Um, Self-regulated learning is when learners take control of their learning environment and their behavior in that environment. So uh, learners in, who are self-regulated develop strategies to tackle challenges. They practice metacognition, which basically means they are thinking about their thinking and able to articulate why they are doing what they are doing. And they also consider their motivation to learn. Successful self-regulated learners then will set goals, they will monitor their progress, and they will reflect on their performance, and they will do this kind of in a cyclical fashion moving forward. So this sounds great, right? Clear cut skills. The problem is like with any skill set, it takes time to develop these strategies and to adapt strategies for new learning environments. But we just got pushed into the deep end um, and many are drowning in it because they haven't had the time to adapt their self-regulated learning or to develop the new strategies that they need. The good news is that these skills can be learned by um, careful scaffolding. So that basically means that mentors or teachers can practice the skill or can demonstrate the skill. So students will observe the skill and then they will emulate the skill or they will practice it themselves, continuing to practice and getting feedback until that skill becomes automatic for them. And then once they reach that level of automaticity, it becomes a self-regulated practice. So in this scaffolding, there is constant feedback from a teacher who is letting them know how they're doing. Um, and they are self-reflecting on how, are, how am I doing? Am I getting better at this learning thing? My question for everyone is, are we in this moment teaching our learners self-regulated learning strategies to manage what's coming at them? Or are we really just focused on pushing content to them or transmitting content to them? Are we focused on their emotions and their motivation and their metacognition? Or are we just figuring out how we're gonna give that exam online? So when we think about um, self-regulated learning models, um, we can think about motivation, emotion, and metacognition. And this comes from a review of self-regulated learning models by Panadero. And he looked at six different models and found these three categories kind of crossed all three models. So skills uh, or self-regulated learning strategies and motivation would be developing competence or the ability to do something, skill level, and self-efficacy or your belief that you can do those things. Self-regulated learning strategies um, focusing on emotion are about managing your expectations and also managing the positive and negative emotions that you might be feeling that might interfere with your learning. Self-regulated learning strategies related to metacognition are going back to those thinking about your thinking or your planning, goal setting, reflecting. Um, and if we look at the strategies, that are embedded in this, we, we realize that many of our students might be unprepared to navigate these new waters that they're in. It's different from a face-to-face -face classroom where actually we should still be working on these self-regulated learning strategies. And this uh, Panadero research uh, looked across studies and found that teaching self-regulated learning strategies focused on metacognition had a really good impact on secondary school students. So if you are in the secondary field, you might wanna be thinking about how to teach them their planning and goal setting and reflection strategies in this new context. It makes sense that metacognition strategies um, work well in the secondary field because this is about the time when students are moving from um, single room classrooms to managing multiple subject areas and to reading to learn. So they're thinking deep, more deeply about content and they're also able to start articulating who they are as individuals and as learners. What was kind of surprising to me in this research was that we can achieve and higher ed and career. So the strategies that seem to work better with those contexts were ones that focused on motivation and on emotion. Now, again, this wasn't looking at just virtual learning. This is just self-regulated learning models and the research that has been done to date. But when I look at 
and act really interested in this category of emotion as we face this moment together. Are we focused on helping our students manage the emotions? And quite frankly, are we managing our own emotions as teachers? This is a time of trauma. And if there were ever a time for trauma-informed teaching pedagogies, it's right now. And so for me, the emotional components of self-regulation are really important. So I just wanna take a pause right now. I'm gonna read you a quote from Bell Hooks. Our work is not merely to share information, but to share in the intellectual and spiritual growth of our students, to teach in a manner that respects and cares for the souls of our students is essential if we are to provide the necessary conditions where learning can most deeply and intimately begin. So I just want you to pause for a second and think, do you have the necessary conditions right now? What caring does your soul need? This is a question no matter what your situation is. If you're a teacher, what caring does your soul need? If you're a student, what caring does your soul need? If you're a grandparent, what caring does your soul need? We are in a moment of trauma and understanding that we all need caring right now is really important for what we do in education. I know that we are focused on this question of how do we teach? How do I use Zoom to interact with my students? How do I flip my classroom? How do I record videos and post them? How do I use Google Classroom? How do I teach? I'm suggesting that maybe instead of that question, we ask the question, how do we learn? And how do my students learn in this moment? Because if we can start with that question of how, how do my students need to learn in this moment, and then we bring in the how do I teach them, I think that we're gonna get at a pedagogy of care, um, which we desperately need right now. So what might this look like just in a practical sense? How can we help our students develop self-regulated learning strategies and kind of bring in this pedagogy of care, understanding that they are in a situation um, that is unprecedented for them, just like as teachers, we're in a situation that's unprecedented for, for us. Um, one thing you could do is to focus on increasing motivation. And one of the best ways to increase motivation is to make content important, useful, and relevant. So all of our motivation researchers out there will say those are the things. It's got to be important, useful, and relevant. So this might mean throwing out what you planned to do um, and thinking about how the content of your course or your class might connect to students' lives in a different way. I was talking to a middle school math teacher who pointed out that there are all kinds of models about COVID-19 that are based in probability and what the students are studying right now is probability. So can we rethink using the math textbook to actually using some models that might help students to make more sense of what's going on in the world and therefore increase their motivation? Um, we can also support our students in planning and goal setting. We can do this by setting clear expectations and deadlines, and this goes back to what was three weeks ago is probably not the same anymore, and we all need to be flexible, but as teachers, we need to be clear about what we're expecting and what those deadlines are. If we have longer term projects, we want to create subtasks, so it's not just turn this paper in at the end of the of the semester or in a couple of weeks, but that we are building subtasks and then checking in with students throughout those subtasks. We also could define an overarching structure. So structure is something that a lot of people are lacking right now. We were in structures that were defined for us by institutions and now we don't have those structures. But we as individual teachers can put a structure on our course and that might look something like uh, rather than meeting every day of the week, Zoom synchronously, we're going to meet Mondays and talk together and I'm going to set you up with some content to engage with in a, in a variety of ways the next couple of days. We might meet in small groups so I can check in with you, but then we won't come back together as a large group until Friday where we're all going to check in and talk about how the learning went and where we're going to go next week. So that might be one example of an overarching structure that is consistent and reliable and helps students with that planning and goal setting for, for their learning.
We could also facilitate awareness of progress. Um, this, this is probably one of the hardest things for us to do as instructors right now is to provide timely feedback. We are getting a lot coming at us but our students really need us to give timely feedback. So this is where I say only have them give you what they need to give you for you to give them feedback on. I'm monitoring a group that has over 20,000 teachers and professors in it, it's the Online Learning Collective. And one of the questions that came up in that group was, do I have, from a professor who has never taught online before, uh, he asked, do I have to respond to every post on the discussion forum? Um, and, you know, the answer to that is no, you don't have to respond to every post on the discussion forum. And quite frankly, if it's a good discussion, the students are going to be pushing each other and, ha and, and thinking through things like that. But you might want to choose one student to give some feedback to um, and give each student some timely feedback toward the course objectives or towards the class goals. That feedback should also be actionable. And this means that you're telling them exactly what they can do to be better, to be a better learner if we're working on self-regulated learning strategies, or to be better with the content, and that they can apply that actionable feedback to the next thing they do in your class. Finally, we can ask our students to reflect on their learning. This is something that I do no matter what kind of class I'm teaching. Um, I ask them to think about what they have learned, how they have learned in relation to goals that they set for themselves. Um, and then we can stop and as a collective review what's been successful and what has been unsuccessful in their strategies. And right now students really need to reflect on what is working well for me and what do I need to do better. And teachers, you can help them with that, but you can also learn from their struggles about what you can do with your own teaching. I also highly recommend that you incorporate that student reflection into your overall assessment. So again, when I am um, working on assessments with students, there will always be some kind of product, a portfolio, um, a presentation, in some cases, maybe a final exam or something like that. But that is not the only assessment that I am taking into account when I give them a grade in my class. Um, and grades are a whole other story that I think right now we can just let go of, but you know, that's another conversation for another day. But that self-assessment, the student's ability to say, I set these goals and I met them and here's why I was able to meet them, or I set these goals and I didn't meet them, I failed, and here's why I failed and what I can do better next time is just as important as the actual output. Um, so I, I highly recommend that you uh, use that assessment in, in their final, their reflection in their final assessment. So, um, here's an example from the field when I think about what we can do right now just to think to bring this pedagogy of care and the student centered classroom together. This is from a teacher that I work with Jill Sadronsky, who um, works in a middle school and the first week that her students were at home doing distance learning. She said, let's come together and write what's happening, like let's process what's happening by creating a, a storybook for our grandkids. So they used Book Creator, and for those of you who have been listening, there's another tool for you. Let's see if someone can pull the, uh, the website and put it in the chat. Um, they used Book Creator where each student had one page that they were just documenting what was happening, how they were learning from home um, during the pandemic. The students loved it so much that during week two, Jill did a second assignment, and this one was less about getting the personal feelings out, although that's still part of it, and it brings it back to the inquiry and research skills that Jill wants to work on with her students. So now they are writing the story and true history of COVID-19, and Jill did a sample page for them. You can see it's a two-page spread now that she's asking. Um, they are finding uh, resources online, and basically, again, this is going to be a living document that is out there, but it is allowing the students to name some things that are happening in their lives to process those emotions so from that aspect these two examples are examples of pedagogy of care I can I 100% know that three weeks ago COVID-19 was not 
in Jill's wheelhouse in terms of the content that she was going to be doing. But she did that shift and she asked her students to process. At the same time, she's asking them to do inquiry. So she's still building skills for them. They are looking at their own experience. They are looking at each other's experience. They are looking out into the world and they are building those skills that they still need to build. So what's tomorrow going to bring? I don't know. What I do know is that I speak with teachers every day who are really excited about the possibilities. They see this moment um, as a transformation. Many of them have been experimenting with technologies for a long time. They've been advocating for their students, for their schools, for their communities, and they say, finally, someone's listening, and this is a moment of transformation, and we're all going to change and be better for it. At the same time, I see a lot of teachers and students who are really overwhelmed and struggling, and that is completely natural and normal. Um, and I'm encouraging everyone to just kind of look to tomorrow and think about what it could be. So for learners, ask yourself, how do you learn best? How did you learn best before this? And what practices can you adapt to this situation or what new practices might you need to develop in order to manage your learning better in this virtual instruction time. The biggest piece of advice I can give you is to advocate for yourself. Don't assume that your professor or your teacher knows if you are struggling. You have to communicate. You have to reach out and interact. You can reach out to peers or you can reach out to your teacher, but advocate for yourself as a learner to get what you need and to move forward in your learning. For teachers, I'm going to challenge you to shift from thinking about how you teach in this situation to how your learners learn and see what happens when you ask that how are your learners learning question before you ask how am I going to teach my content right now. So we are just beginning this journey and this adventure together and we really need to be the change that finds the hope and not the dark side of what's happening here. I want to thank all the teachers out here out there of every level. I know that you care deeply and you are working your tails off to transition from one environment to another. And I can't say enough about all the wonderful things that I have seen and the communities of support that have emerged from this. To all the learners out there, I want to say you are rising to this challenge and you're going to continue to rise to it and you are transforming education for those that come behind you. So keep at it. And then to us as a community, I want to say we've uncovered some holes in our system here and we need to work together to change these things and not let this opportunity go to waste. So thank you so much for your time and I guess we'll take questions now. Yes, thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple questions here and I'm sure we'll get a couple more coming in uh, through the chat. Um, the first question is uh, what methods of parent engagement have teachers been using to engage learners and their families in areas where students do not have access to computers? Um, so I have seen, I would say going back to that transmission um, model of distance education, I have seen that uh, schools have been creating content and packets um, and sending that those information home for children to work with. Um, we, I think schools are still trying to figure out how that transmission model is going to work, like how are teachers going to get that back from students. Uh, from the parents that have been dealing with this that I've talked to, the teachers' packets are phenomenal. Like there are very clear instructions. Uh, it does put a lot of onus on the parents, particularly of young children, to help navigate the learning at home, which is another challenge of this time. I've also seen I've also seen that there are companies that are stepping up and giving access so free Wi Fi free technology getting technology in students hands so it's kind of across the board there. Okay, we got another question here. Um, if I only have three weeks to prepare an online version of the class I'll be teaching what are the most important things like content presentation tools, etc. that I need to do and they added that they'll be using blackboard. Okay, so I would go back to that um, model of thinking about the interactions. So 
students need to interact with content, they need to interact with their peers or people beyond their peers, and they need to interact with the instructor. So starting with how do you want interaction to happen in this online class is really the first, is really the first place I would start. Uh, if you're using Blackboard, which to be honest, I haven't used Blackboard in a very long time, so I'm not sure about all the new tools that are available there, but I know there are a lot of collaboration tools where students can work together. Um, and you can also have one-on-one -on -one, you know, feedback going from the student to teacher. But I would also say don't just limit it to Blackboard in thinking about how you want students to interact with content. There are, and, and other people, there are plenty of places outside the walls of Blackboard that students can interact. But go back to how do I want them to interact? That's the first thing. Okay, we got another one here. Um, besides helping with technology, do you see a role for students to help with pedagogy in secondary school? Um, so is that related to the high school students themselves or? Um, or are, are those some of my teacher educator students asking questions here? <laughs> uh, that one was, uh, the, that's for high school students. High school students. Um, so yeah, uh, I think that no matter what level classroom you're in, students can help with pedagogy because they can be experts in something. So I think the example that I shared of um, the middle schooler, Megan, who is now, she's not only teaching people outside of school, but she is teaching people in the school and teaching her teachers how to teach people in the school based on her knowledge is a great example. So high schoolers, you have a lot of knowledge. You can give feedback to your teachers. I'm hoping that your teachers are willing to ask you for it at this time because I think that you can definitely help them. Okay, we got a couple more coming in here. Um, as we decide, what to do synchronously and asynchronously, what do you believe are the most important things to spend a very valuable synchronous time on? Um, I think that the most valuable synchronous time happens when you can have small group conversations or one-on-one -on -one conversations. So students have been saying they really crave the synchronous time. I would not make everything asynchronous if you don't have to, um, but I would say that uh, rather than having a large, try to have a large group discussion in a Zoom classroom uh, to break it down into smaller groups. So if you are teaching using Zoom, there are small group breakouts that can happen, or you can just arrange to have small group discussions. But those are the kinds of conversations, the one-on-one -on -one feedback or small group discussions that I would really reserve for synchronous time. Okay, we got one um, from a parent who has, uh, I think a couple students in, um, in college right now, she said, my son's professor is not meeting regularly with the students as a class and is just posting material online and having the students teach themselves, but is designing tests with material not scheduled to be taught after the test. What can be done at this point if a professor is not actively teaching students, but is still grading them as if they are? And she also added, where's the value in a college education if this is, <laughs> if this is what they're receiving? Wow, there's a lot embedded in that question um, that I think kind of is what I was aiming for with some of the things that I was talking about in this presentation that um, that really sounds like a transmission model to me where the teacher is giving the content, asking the students to interact with that content and learn it on their own um, and then evaluating whether the student learned it. So um, that does not engage students in inquiry and um, it's certainly probably not an example of the best practice, but I would encourage students in that situation to advocate for themselves and to ask for help with their learning so that they can be successful on the assessments that they are given. Okay, I think we have one more here, um, or two, sorry. Um, one said, uh, my students wanted our course online to run the same way that it did when we were face-to-face, -face, which was student-based and guided inquiry. They emphasized that they didn't want to change much since change was threatening to them at the, at the moment. Um, so how do you balance the need to optimize teaching and learning strategies online with the desires of the students to experience minimal change in this crazy time? Yeah, I wish that we all could um, not change in this crazy time. And I, I think this goes back to the pedagogy of care. I love that 
whoever asked this question knows what their students want because that means that, that this teacher started by asking their students. Um, and it makes a lot of sense that students are craving that similar structure that they had in a face-to-face -face class. It's really, really impossible to just recreate a face-to-face -face class in an online setting. We have to think about how the interactions with content and each other are happening. Um, and so I would just take it one step at a time and say, okay, you know, this week we're going to try this Zoom thing. Um, everybody's going to be in the classroom like we always were. And then we're going to talk about how that went. And then the next time we might try something different and we're going to talk about how that went. This is a time for learning and reflection for everybody. And it's not just about getting through the content or getting to the end of the course, but really working together as a community to, to learn new skills all around. And there's, uh, we have two more and then we'll close it off um, since we're running up against three o'clock here. Um, one is, is there space for teacher inquiry in an atmosphere of trauma? I think referring to the coronavirus chaos. Um, if so, what could that look like? And if not, how can we teach away from that delivery model if we don't have the space for reflection? Okay, so, um is there a space for teacher inquiry uh, in this trauma? I'm not sure if the person is asking for a legitimate community um, that is working on this, but there are several communities who are thinking about uh, the trauma that we are experiencing and how we um, work toward that, you know, overcoming that trauma. The National Writing Project is doing a lot of work on this, as is the National Council of Teachers of English. They're actually hosting um, meetings regularly and open forums for members and non-members that are dealing with some of these issues of trauma. One thing that I can say is that writing is a really, really good tool for processing the trauma. So whether you're having your students write or whether you are writing, um, that's uh, a really wonderful way to process trauma and work through it. Writing is also a reflection tool. Um, and one of the amazing things about this time is all of the online communities that are opening up. So uh, if you are not on a social media website, I, I highly recommend that you find one that you feel comfortable with and just start searching for teacher groups because there are lots of groups out there who are giving support to each other and creating a space for both reflection and for dealing with the trauma. Okay, thank you. I think that last question uh, answered the, the other last question that we had. So I think we're all set here. Um, thank you so much um, for everyone who joined in and for uh, Chris and Turner um, for delivering this presentation. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks, everybody.